Good evening and welcome. Tonight, I'm honored to introduce myself as Emily from Sleep Scribe. My purpose is simple yet profound to guide you on a journey to a restful and rejuvenating night's sleep. Through the timeless magic of fairy tales and the gentle embrace of soothing sounds, I'm here to lead you to a sanctuary of tranquility. Today, we continue our journey into part two of Alice in Wonderland, where the whimsical world of Wonderland awaits us once more with new mysteries to uncover and enchanting characters to meet. But before we begin our story, let's start with a meditation exercise to relax before bedtime. Begin by finding a comfortable position in your bed, allowing your body to sink into the mattress and your muscles to relax. Close your eyes gently and bring your awareness to your breath. Inhale deeply, counting to four, and exhale slowly, counting to five, releasing any tension with each breath. Continue this rhythmic breathing pattern, inhaling for four counts and exhaling for six, allowing yourself to sink deeper into relaxation with each breath. As you feel more at ease, gradually extend your exhalation, inhaling for four counts and exhaling for seven, then eight. If you encounter any discomfort or breathlessness, simply return to the previous count without forcing it, allowing yourself to find your own natural rhythm. As you continue this meditation, allow your breath to return to its natural pace, observing the sensation of each inhale and exhale without trying to control it. Stay present in the moment, focusing your attention on the flow of your breath and the gentle rise and fall of your chest. If your mind begins to wander, gently guide it back to the rhythm of your breathing, acknowledging any thoughts or distractions without judgment. Allow yourself to let go of any worries or stress, embracing the stillness and tranquility of the present moment. By incorporating these calming meditation techniques into your bedtime routine, you can cultivate a sense of inner peace and relaxation that prepares your mind and body for a restful night's sleep. Chapter 5 Advice from a Caterpillar The Caterpillar and Alice looked at each other for some time in silence. At last, the Caterpillar took the hookah out of its mouth and addressed her in a languid, sleepy voice. Who are you? said the Caterpillar. This was not an encouraging opening for a conversation. Alice replied rather shyly, I, I hardly know, sir just at present. At least, I know who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have been changed several times since then. What do you mean by that? said the caterpillar sternly. Explain yourself. I can't explain myself, I'm afraid, sir, said Alice, because I'm not myself, you see. I don't see, said the caterpillar. I'm afraid I can't put it more clearly, Alice replied very politely for I can't understand it myself to begin with. And being so many different sizes in a day is very confusing. It isn't, said the caterpillar. Well, perhaps you haven't found it so yet, said Alice. But when you have to turn into a chrysalis, you will someday, you know. And then, after that, into a butterfly, I should think you'll feel it a little queer, won't you? Not a bit said the caterpillar. Well, perhaps your feelings may be different, said Alice. All I know is, it would feel very queer to me. You, said the caterpillar contemptuously. Who are you? What brought them back again at the beginning of the conversation? Alice felt a little irritated at the caterpillars making such very short remarks, and 
she drew herself up and said, very gravely, I think you ought to tell me who you are first. Why? said the caterpillar. Here was another puzzling question. And as Alice could not think of any good reason, and as the caterpillar seemed to be in a very unpleasant state of mind, she turned away. Come back, the caterpillar called after her. I have something important to say. This sounded promising, certainly. Alice turned and came back again. Keep your temper, said the caterpillar. Is that all? said Alice, swallowing down her anger as well as she could. No, said the caterpillar. Alice thought she might as well wait, as she had nothing else to do, and perhaps after all, it might tell her something worth hearing. For some minutes, it puffed away without speaking, but at last, it unfolded its arms, took the hook out of its mouth again, and said, So you think you're changed, do you? I'm afraid I am, sir, said Alice. I can't remember things as I used, and I don't keep the same size for ten minutes together. Can't remember what things, said the caterpillar. Well, I've tried to say, how doth the little busy bee, but it all came different, Alice replied in a very melancholy voice. Repeat, you are old, Father William, said the caterpillar. Alice folded her hands and began. You are old, Father William, the young man said, and your hair has become very white, and yet you incessantly stand on your head. Do you think, at your age, it is right? In my youth, Father William replied to his son, I feared it might injure the brain. But now that I'm perfectly sure I have none, why, I do it again and again. You are old said the youth, as I mentioned before, and have grown most uncommonly fat. Yet you turned a back somersault in at the door. Pray, what is the reason of that? In my youth, said the sage, as he shook his grey locks, I kept all my limbs very supple by the use of this ointment, one shilling the box. Allow me to sell you a couple. You are old, said the youth, and your jaws are too weak for anything tougher than suet. Yet you finish the goose with the bones and the beak. Pray, how did you manage to do it? In my youth, said his father, I took to the law and argued each case with my wife, and the muscular strength which it gave to my jaw has lasted the rest of my life. You are old, said the youth, one would hardly suppose that your eye was as steady as ever. Yet, you balanced an eel on the end of your nose. What made you so awfully clever? I have answered three questions, and that is enough, said his father. Don't give yourself airs. Do you think I can listen all day to such stuff? Be off or I'll kick you downstairs. That is not said right, said the caterpillar. Not quite right, I'm afraid, said Alice timidly. Some of the words have got altered. It is wrong from beginning to end, said the caterpillar decidedly, and there was silence for some minutes. The caterpillar was the first to speak. What size do you want to be? it asked. Oh, I'm not particular as to size, Alice hastily replied. Only one doesn't like changing so often, you know. I don't know, said the caterpillar. Alice said nothing. She had never been so much contradicted in her life before, and she felt that she was losing her temper. Are you content now, said the caterpillar. Well, I should like to be a little larger, sir, if you wouldn't mind, said Alice. Three inches is such a wretched height to be. It is a very good height indeed, said the caterpillar angrily, rearing itself upright as it spoke. It was exactly three inches high. But I'm not used to it, pleaded poor Alice in a piteous tone. And 
she thought of herself. I wish the creatures wouldn't be so easily offended. You'll get used to it in time, said the caterpillar, and it put the hookah into its mouth and began smoking again. This time, Alice waited patiently until it chose to speak again. In a minute or two, the caterpillar took the hookah out of its mouth and yawned once or twice and shook itself. Then it got down off the mushroom and crawled away in the grass, merely remarking as it went. One side will make you grow taller, and the other side will make you grow shorter. One side of what? The other side of what? Thought Alice to herself. Of the mushroom, said the caterpillar, just as if she had asked it aloud. And in another moment, it was out of sight. Alice remained looking thoughtfully at the mushroom for a minute, trying to make out which were the two sides of it. And as it was perfectly round, she found this a very difficult question. However, at last, she stretched her arms round it as far as they would go and broke off a bit of the edge with each hand. And now, which is which, she said to herself, and nibbled a little of the right-hand bit to try the effect. The next moment, she felt a violent blow underneath her chin. It had struck her foot. She was a good deal frightened by this very sudden change, but she felt that there was no time to be lost, as she was shrinking rapidly. So she set to work at once to eat some of the other bit. Her chin was pressed so closely against her foot that there was hardly room to open her mouth. But she did it at last, and managed to swallow a morsel of the left-hand bit. Come, my head's free at last, said Alice, in a tone of delight, which changed into alarm in another moment when she found that her shoulders were nowhere to be found. All she could see when she looked down was an immense length of neck, which seemed to rise like a stalk out of a sea of green leaves that lay far below her. What can all that green stuff be? said Alice. And where have my shoulders got to? And oh, my poor hands, how is it I can't see you? She was moving them about as she spoke, but no result seemed to follow, except a little shaking among the distant green leaves. As there seemed to be no chance of getting her hands up to her head, she tried to get her head down to them, and was delighted to find that her neck went about easily in any direction, like a serpent. She had just succeeded in curving it down to a graceful zigzag and was going to dive in among the leaves which she found to be nothing but the tops of the trees under which she had been wandering when a sharp hiss made her draw back in a hurry a large pigeon had flown into her face and was beating her violently with its wings serpent screamed the pigeon I'm not a serpent said Alice indignantly let me alone. Serpent, I say again, repeated the pigeon, but in a more subdued tone, and added with a kind of sob, I've tried every way, and nothing seems to suit them. I haven't the least idea what you're talking about, said Alice. I've tried the roots of trees, and I've tried banks, and I've tried hedges, the pigeon went on, without attending to her. Oh, serpents, there's no pleasing them. Alice was more and more puzzled, but she thought there was no use in saying anything more till the pigeon had finished. As if it wasn't trouble enough hatching the eggs, said the pigeon. But I must be on the lookout for serpents night and day. Why, I haven't had a wink of sleep these three weeks. I'm very sorry you've been annoyed said Alice, who was beginning to see its meaning. 
And just as I'd taken the highest tree in the wood, continued the pigeon, raising its voice to a shriek, and just as I was thinking, I should be free of them at last. They must needs come wriggling down from the sky. Ugh, serpent. But I'm not a serpent, I tell you, said Alice. I'm a, I'm a... Well, what are you, pigeon? I can see you're trying to invent something. I, I'm a little girl, said Alice, rather doubtfully, as she remembered the number of changes she had gone through that day. A likely story indeed, said the pigeon, in a tone of the deepest contempt. I've seen a good many little girls in my time, but never one with such a neck as that. No, no, you're a serpent, and there's no use denying it. I suppose you'll be telling me next that you never tasted an egg. I have tasted eggs, certainly, said Alice, who was a very truthful child. But little girls eat eggs quite as much as serpents do, you know. I don't believe it, said the pigeon. But if they do, why then they're a kind of serpent? That's all I can say. This was such a new idea to Alice that she was quite silent for a minute or two, which gave the pigeon the opportunity of adding, You're looking for eggs. I know that well enough. And what does it matter to me whether you're a little girl or a serpent? It matters a good deal to me, said Alice hastily. But I'm not looking for eggs, as it happens. And if I was, I shouldn't want yours. I don't like them raw. Well, be off then, said the pigeon in a sulky tone as it settled down again into its nest. Alice crouched down among the trees as well as she could, for her neck getting entangled among the branches, and every now and then she had to stop and untwist it. After a while, she remembered that she still held the pieces of mushroom in her hands, and she set to work very carefully, nibbling first at one and then at the other, and growing sometimes taller and sometimes shorter, until she had succeeded in bringing herself down to her usual height. It was so long since she had been anything near the right size, it felt quite strange at first. She got used to it in a few minutes, and began talking to herself, as usual. Come, there's half my plan done now. How puzzling all these changes are. I'm never sure what I'm going to be from one minute to another. However, I've got back to my right size. The next thing is to get into that beautiful garden. How is that to be done, I wonder? As she said this, she came suddenly upon an open place with a little house in it about four feet high. Whoever lives there, thought Alice, it'll never do to come upon them this size. Why, I should frighten them out of their wits. So she began nibbling at the right hand bit again, and did not venture to go near the house till she had brought herself down to nine inches high. Chapter 6 Pig and Pepper For a minute or two, she stood looking at the house and wondering what to do next. When suddenly, a footman in livery came running out of the wood. She considered him to be a footman because he was in livery. Otherwise, judging by his face only, she would have called him a fish and rapped loudly at the door with his knuckles. It was opened by another footman in livery with a round face and large eyes like a frog. And both footmen, Alice noticed, had powdered hair that curled all over their heads. She felt very curious to know what it was all about and crept a little way out of the wood to listen. The fish footman began by producing from under his arm a great letter nearly as large as himself 
and this he handed over to the other, saying, in a solemn tone, for the Duchess, an invitation from the Queen to play croquet. The frog footman repeated, in the same solemn tone, only changing the order of the words a little. From the Queen, an invitation for the Duchess to play croquet. Then they both bowed low, and their curls got entangled together. Alice laughed so much at this that she had to run back into the wood for fear of their hearing her. And when she next peeped out, the fish footman was gone, and the other was sitting on the ground near the door, staring stupidly up into the sky. Alice went timidly up to the door and knocked. There's no sort of use in knocking, said the footman, and that for two reasons. First, because I'm on the same side of the door as you are. Secondly, because they're making such a noise inside, no one could possibly hear you. And certainly, there was a most extraordinary noise going on within, a constant howling and sneezing, and every now and then a great crash, as if a dish or kettle had been broken to pieces. Please, then, said Alice, how am I to get in? There might be some sense in your knocking, the footman went on without attending to her, if we had the door between us. For instance, if you were inside, you might knock, and I could let you out, you know. He was looking up into the sky all the time he was speaking, and this Alice thought decidedly uncivil. But perhaps he can't help it, she said to herself. His eyes are so very nearly at the top of his head. But at any rate, he might answer questions. How am I to get in? She repeated aloud. I shall sit here, the footman remarked, till tomorrow, at this moment, the door of the house opened, and a large plate came skimming out, straight at the footman's head. It just grazed his nose and broke to pieces against one of the trees behind him. Or next day, maybe, the footman continued in the same tone, exactly as if nothing had happened. How am I to get in? asked Alice again in a louder tone. Are you to get in at all? said the footman. That's the first question, you know. It was, no doubt. Only Alice did not like to be told so. It's really dreadful, she muttered to herself, the way all the creatures argue. It's enough to drive one crazy. The footman seemed to think this a good opportunity for repeating his remark, with variations. I shall sit here, he said, on and off, for days and days. What am I to do? said Alice. Anything you like, said the footman, and began whistling. Oh, there's no use in talking to him, Alice desperately. He's perfectly idiotic. And she opened the door and went in. The door led right into a large kitchen, which was full of smoke from one end to the other. The Duchess was sitting on a three-legged stool in the middle, nursing a baby. The cook was leaning over the fire, stirring a large cauldron, which seemed to be full of soup. There's certainly too much pepper in that soup, Alice said to herself, as well as she could for sneezing. There was certainly too much of it in the air. Even the Duchess sneezed occasionally. And as for the baby, it was sneezing and howling alternately, without a moment's pause. The only things in the kitchen that did not sneeze were the cook and a large cat, which was sitting on the hearth and grinning from ear to ear. Please, would you tell me, said Alice, a little timidly, for she was not quite sure whether it was good manners for her to speak first. Why your cat grins like that? It's a Cheshire cat, said the Duchess, and that's why, pig. She said the last word with such sudden violence that Alice quite jumped. But she saw in another moment 
that it was addressed to the baby and not to her. So she took courage and went on again. I didn't know that Cheshire cats always grinned. In fact, I didn't know that cats could grin. They all can, said the Duchess, and most of them do. I don't know of any that do, Alice said very politely, feeling quite pleased to have got into a conversation. You don't know much, said the Duchess, and that's a fact. Alice did not at all like the tone of this remark and thought it would be as well to introduce some other subject of conversation. While she was trying to fix on one, the cook took the cauldron of soup off the fire and at once set to work throwing everything within her reach at the Duchess and the baby. The fire irons came first. Then followed a shower of saucepans, plates, and dishes. The Duchess took no notice of them, even when they hit her. And the baby was howling so much already that it was quite impossible to say whether the blows hurt it or not. Oh, please mind what you're doing, cried Alice, jumping up and down in an agony of terror. Oh, there goes his precious nose. As an unusually large saucepan flew close by it and very nearly carried it off. If everybody minded their own business, the Duchess said in a hoarse growl, the world would go round a deal faster than it does. Which would not be an advantage, said Alice, who felt very glad to get an opportunity of showing off a little of her knowledge. Just think of what work it would make with the day and night. You see, the earth takes 24 hours to turn round on its axis, Talking of axes, said the Duchess, chop off her head. Alice glanced rather anxiously at the cook to see if she meant to take the hint. But the cook was busily stirring the soup and seemed not to be listening. So she went on again. Twenty-four hours, I think. Or is it twelve? I... Oh, don't bother me, said the Duchess. I never could abide figures. And with that, she began nursing her child again, singing a sort of lullaby to it as she did so, and giving it a violent shake at the end of every line. Speak roughly to your little boy, and beat him when he sneezes. He only does it to annoy, because he knows it teases. Chorus, in which the cook and the baby joined. Wow, wow, wow. While the Duchess sang the second verse of the song, she kept tossing the baby violently up and down, and the poor little thing howled so that Alice could hardly hear the words. I speak severely to my boy. I beat him when he sneezes, for he can thoroughly enjoy the pepper when he pleases. Chorus. Wow, wow, wow. Here, you may nurse it a bit, if you like, the Duchess said to Alice, flinging the baby at her as she spoke. I must go and get ready to play croquet with the queen. And she hurried out of the room. The cook threw a frying pan after her as she went out, but it just missed her. Alice caught the baby with some difficulty, as it was a queer-shaped little creature, and held out its arms and legs in all directions. Just like a starfish, thought Alice. The poor little thing was snorting like a steam engine when she caught it, and kept doubling itself up and straightening itself out again, so that altogether, for the first minute or two, it was as much as she could do to hold it. As soon as she had made out the proper way of nursing it, which was to twist it up into a sort of knot, and then keep tight hold of its right ear and left foot, so as to prevent its undoing itself. She carried it out into the open air. If I don't take this child away with me, thought Alice, they're sure to kill it in a day or two. Wouldn't it be murder to leave it behind? She said the last words out loud, and the little thing grunted in reply. It had left off sneezing by this time. Don't grunt, said Alice. That's 
not at all a proper way of expressing yourself. The baby grunted again, and Alice looked very anxiously into its face to see what was the matter with it. There could be no doubt that it had a very turn-up nose, much more like a snout than a real nose. Also, its eyes were getting extremely small for a baby. Altogether, Alice did not like the look of the thing at all. But perhaps it was only sobbing, she thought, and looked into its eyes again to see if there were any tears. No, there were no tears. If you're going to turn into a pig, my dear, said Alice seriously, I'll have nothing more to do with you. Mind now. The poor little thing sobbed again, or grunted. It was impossible to say which. And they went on for some while in silence. Alice was just beginning to think to herself, Now, what am I to do with this creature when I get it home? When it grunted again, so violently, she looked down into its face in some alarm. This time, there could be no mistake about it. It was neither more nor less than a pig, and she felt it would be quite absurd for her to carry it further. So she set the little creature down, and felt quite relieved to see it trot away quietly into the wood. If it had grown up, she said to herself, it would have made a dreadfully ugly child, but it makes rather a handsome pig, I think. And she began thinking over other children she knew, who might do very well as pigs, and was just saying to herself, if one only knew the right way to change them. When she was a little startled by seeing the Cheshire Cat sitting on a bough of a tree a few yards off, the cat only grinned when it saw Alice. It looked good-natured, she thought. Still, it had very long claws and a great many teeth. So she felt that it ought to be treated with respect. Chapter 7 A Mad Tea Party There was a table set out under a tree in front of the house, and the March Hare and the Hatter were having tea at it. A Dormouse was sitting between them, fast asleep, and the other two were using it as a cushion, resting their elbows on it, and talking over its head. Very uncomfortable for the Dormouse, thought Alice, only, as it's asleep, I suppose it doesn't mind. The table was a large one. The three were all crowded together at one corner of it. No room, no room, they cried out when they saw Alice coming. There's plenty of room, said Alice indignantly, and she sat down in a large armchair at one end of the table. Have some wine, the March Hare said in an encouraging tone. Alice looked all round the table, but there was nothing on it but tea. I don't see any wine, she remarked. There isn't any, said the March Hare. Then it wasn't very civil of you to offer it, said Alice angrily. It wasn't very civil of you to sit down without being invited, said the March Hare. I didn't know it was your table, said Alice. It's laid for a great many more than three. Your hair wants cutting, said the Hatter. He had been looking at Alice for some time with great curiosity, and this was his first speech. You should learn not to make personal remarks, Alice said with some severity. It's very rude. The Hatter opened his eyes very wide on hearing this. But all he said was, Why is a raven like a writing desk? Come, we shall have some fun now, thought Alice. I'm glad they've begun asking riddles. I believe I can guess that, she added aloud. Do you mean that you think you can find out the answer to it? said the March Hare. Exactly so said Alice. Then you should say what you mean, the March Hare went on. I do, Alice hastily replied. At least, at least I mean what I say. That's the same thing, you know. Not the same thing a bit, 
said the Hatter. You might just as well say that I see what I eat is the same thing as I eat what I see. You might just as well say, added the March Hare, that I like what I get is the same thing as I get what I like. You might just as well say, added the Dormouse, who seemed to be talking in his sleep, that I breathe when I sleep is the same thing as I sleep when I breathe. It is the same thing with you, said the Hatter. And here the conversation dropped, and the party sat silent for a minute, while Alice thought over all she could remember about ravens and writing desks, which wasn't much. The Hatter was the first to break the silence. What day of the month is it? he said, turning to Alice. He had taken his watch out of his pocket and was looking at it uneasily, shaking it every now and then, and holding it to his ear. Alice considered a little, and then said, The fourth. Two days wrong, sighed the Hatter. I told you butter wouldn't suit the works, he added, looking angrily at the March Hare. It was the best butter, the March Hare meekly replied. Yes, but some crumbs must have got in as well, the Hatter grumbled. You shouldn't have put it in with the bread knife. The March Hare took the watch and looked at it gloomily. Then he dipped it into his cup of tea and looked at it again. But he could think of nothing better to say than his first remark. It was the best butter, you know. Alice had been looking over his shoulder with some curiosity. What a funny watch, she remarked. It tells the day of the month and doesn't tell what o'clock it is. Why should it? muttered the Hatter. Does your watch tell you what year it is? Of course not, Alice replied very readily. But that's because it stays the same year for such a long time together. Which is just the case with mine, said the Hatter. Alice felt dreadfully puzzled. The Hatter's remark seemed to have no sort of meaning in it, and yet it was certainly English. I don't quite understand you, she said, as politely as she could. The Dormouse is asleep again, said the Hatter, and he poured a little hot tea upon its nose. The Dormouse shook its head impatiently and said without opening its eyes, Of course, of course, just what I was going to remark myself. Have you guessed the riddle yet? The Hatter said, turning to Alice again. No, I give it up, Alice replied. What's the answer? I haven't the slightest idea, said the Hatter. Nor I, said the March Hare. Alice sighed wearily. I think you might do something better with the time, she said, than waste it in asking riddles that have no answers. If you knew time as well as I do, said the Hatter, you wouldn't talk about wasting it. It's him. I don't know what you mean, said Alice. Of course you don't, the Hatter said, tossing his head contemptuously. I dare say you never even spoke to time. Perhaps not, Alice cautiously replied. But I know I have to beat time when I learn music. Ah, that accounts for it, said the Hatter. He won't stand beating. Now, if you only kept on good terms with him, he'd do almost anything you liked with the clock. For instance, suppose it were nine o'clock in the morning, just time to begin lessons. You'd only have to whisper a hint to time, and round goes the clock in a twinkling. Half past one, time for dinner. I only wish it was, the March Hare said to itself in a whisper. That would be grand, certainly said Alice thoughtfully. But then, I shouldn't be hungry for it, you know. Not at first, perhaps, said the Hatter. But you could keep it to half past one, as long as you liked. Is that the way you manage? Alice asked. The Hatter shook his head mournfully. Not I, he replied. 
We quarreled last March. Just before he went mad, you know. Pointing with his teaspoon at the March hair. It was at the great concert given by the Queen of Hearts. And I had to sing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Bat. How I wonder what you're at. You know the song, perhaps? I've heard something like it, said Alice. It goes on, you know, the Hatter continued. In this way, up above the world you fly, like a tea tray in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle. Here, the Dormouse shook itself and began singing in its sleep. Twinkle, 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 twinkle. It went on so long that they had to pinch it to make it stop. Well, I'd hardly finished the first verse, said the Hatter, when the Queen jumped up and bawled out. He's murdering the time. Off with his head. How dreadfully savage, exclaimed Alice. And ever since that, the Hatter went on in a mournful tone, he won't do a thing I ask. It's always six o'clock now. A bright idea came into Alice's head. Is that the reason so many tea things are put out here? She asked. Yes, that's it, said the Hatter with a sigh. It's always tea time, and we've no time to wash the things between whiles. Then you keep moving round, I suppose, said Alice. Exactly so, said the Hatter, as the things get used up. What happens when you come to the beginning again? Alice ventured to ask. Suppose we change the subject, the March Hare interrupted, yawning. I'm getting tired of this. I vote the young lady tells us a story. I'm afraid I don't know one, said Alice, rather alarmed at the proposal. Then the Dormouse shall, they both cried. Wake up, Dormouse. And they pinched it on both sides at once. The Dormouse slowly opened his eyes. I wasn't asleep, he said in a hoarse, feeble voice. I heard every word you fellows were saying. Tell us a story, said the March Hare. Yes, please do, pleaded Alice. And be quick about it, added the Hatter, or you'll be asleep again before it's done. Once upon a time, there were three little sisters, the Dormouse began in a great hurry, and their names were Elsie, Lacey, and Tilly, and they lived at the bottom of a well. What did they live on, said Alice, who always took a great interest in questions of eating and drinking. They lived on treacle, said the Dormouse, after thinking a minute or two. They couldn't have done that, you know, Alice gently remarked. They'd have been ill. So they were, said the Dormouse. Very ill. Alice tried to fancy to herself what such an extraordinary ways of living would be like but it puzzled her too much. So she went on. But why did they live at the bottom of a well? Take some more tea, the March Hare said to Alice, very earnestly. I've had nothing yet, Alice replied in an offended tone, so I can't take more. You mean you can't take less, the Hatter. It's very easy to take more than nothing. Nobody asked your opinion, said Alice. Who's making personal remarks now? The Hatter asked triumphantly. Alice did not quite know what to say to this. So she helped herself to some tea and bread and butter, and then turned to the Dormouse and repeated her question. Why did they live at the bottom of a well? The Dormouse again took a minute or two to think about it, and then said, It was a treacle well. There's no such thing. Alice was beginning very angrily. The Hatter and the March Hare went, Shh, shh. And the Dormouse sulkily remarked, If you can't be civil, you'd better finish the story for yourself. No, please go on, Alice said very humbly. I won't interrupt again. I dare say there may be one. One, indeed, said the Dormouse indignantly. However, he consented to go on. And so, these three little sisters, they were learning to draw, you know. What did they draw? 
said Alice, quite forgetting her promise. Treacle, said the Dormouse, without considering it all this time. I want a clean cup, interrupted the Hatter. Let's all move one place on. He moved on as he spoke, and the Dormouse followed him. The March Hare moved into the Dormouse's place, and Alice rather unwillingly took the place of the March Hare. The Hatter was the only one who got any advantage from the change, and Alice was a good deal worse off than before, as the March Hare had just upset the milk jug into his plate. Alice did not wish to offend the Dormouse again, so she began very cautiously. But I don't understand. Where did they draw the treacle from? You can draw water out of a water well, said the Hatter. So I should think you could draw treacle out of a treacle well. Eh, stupid? But they were in the well, Alice said to the Dormouse, not choosing to notice this last remark. Of course they were, said the Dormouse. Well in. This answer so confused poor Alice that she let the Dormouse go on for some time without interrupting it. They were learning to draw, the Dormouse went on, yawning and rubbing its eyes, for it was getting very sleepy. And they drew all manner of things. Everything that begins with an M. Why with an M, said Alice. Why not, said the March Hare. Alice was silent. The Dormouse had closed its eyes by this time was going off into a doze. But, on being pinched by the hatter, it woke up again with a little shriek and went on. That begins with an M, such as mouse traps and the moon and memory and muchness. You know, you say things are much of a muchness. Did you ever see such a thing as a drawing of a muchness? Really, now you ask me, said Alice, very much confused. I don't think. Then you shouldn't talk, said the Hatter. This piece of rudeness was more than Alice could bear. She got up in great disgust and walked off. The Dormouse fell asleep instantly, and neither of the others took the least notice of her going, though she looked back once or twice, half hoping that they would call after her the last time she saw them, they were trying to put the Dormouse into the teapot. At any rate, I'll never go there again, said Alice, as she picked her way through the wood. It's the stupidest tea party I ever was at in all my life. Just as she said this, she noticed that one of the trees had a door leading right into it. That's very curious, she thought. But everything's curious today. I think I may as well go in at once. And in she went. Once more she found herself in the long hall and close to the little glass table. Now, I'll manage better this time, she said to herself, and began by taking the little golden key and unlocking the door that led into the garden. Then she went to work nibbling at the mushroom. She had kept a piece of it in her pocket till she was about a foot high. Then she walked down the little passage and then she found herself at last in the beautiful garden among the bright flower beds and the cool fountains. Chapter 8 The Queen's Croquet Ground A large rose tree stood near the entrance of the garden. The roses growing on it were white, but there were three gardeners at it, busily painting them red. Alice thought this a very curious thing, and she went nearer to watch them. And just as she came up to them, she heard one of them say, Look out now, five. Don't go splashing paint over me like that. 
I couldn't help it, said Five, in a sulky tone. Seven jogged my elbow, on which Seven looked up and said, That's right, Five. Always lay the blame on others. You'd better not talk, said Five. I heard the Queen say, only yesterday, you deserve to be beheaded. What for? said the one who had spoken first. That's none of your business, too, said Seven. Yes, it is his business, said Five, and I'll tell him. It was for bringing the cooked tulip roots instead of onions. Seven flung down his brush and had just begun. Well, of all the unjust things. When his eye chanced to fall upon Alice as she stood watching them, and he checked himself suddenly. The others looked round also, and all of them bowed low. Would you tell me, said Alice, a little timidly, why you are painting those roses? Five and seven said nothing, but looked at two. Two began in a low voice. Why the fact is, you see, miss, this here ought to have been a red rose tree, and we put a white one in by mistake. And if the queen was to find it out, we should all have our heads cut off, you know. So you see, miss, we're doing our best, afore she comes, too. At this moment, five, who had been anxiously looking across the garden, called out, The queen! The queen! And the three gardeners instantly threw themselves flat upon their faces. There was a sound of many footsteps and Alice looked round, eager to see the queen. First came ten soldiers carrying gloves. These were all shaped like the three gardeners, oblong and flat, with their hands and feet at the corners. Next, the ten courtiers. These were ornamented all over with diamonds, and walked two and two, as the soldiers did. After these came the royal children. There were ten of them, and the little deers came jumping merrily along hand in hand in couples. They were all ornamented with hearts. Next came the guests, mostly kings and queens, and among them Alice recognized the white rabbit. It was talking in a hurried, nervous manner, smiling at everything that was said, and went by without noticing her. Then followed the knave of hearts, carrying the king's crown on a crimson velvet cushion. And last of all this grand procession came the king and queen of hearts. Alice was rather doubtful whether she ought not to lie down on her face like the three gardeners, but she could not remember ever having heard of such a rule at processions. And besides, what would be the use of a procession, thought she, if people had all to lie down upon their faces so that they couldn't see it. So she stood still where she was and waited. When the procession came opposite to Alice, they all stopped and looked at her. And the queen said severely, Who is this? She said it to the knave of hearts, who only bowed and smiled in reply. Idiot, said the queen, tossing her head impatiently. And turning to Alice, she went on, What's your name, child? My name is Alice, so please your majesty, said Alice very politely. But she added to herself, Why, they're only a pack of cards after all. I needn't be afraid of them. And who are these? said the queen, pointing to the three gardeners who were lying round the rose tree. For, you see, as they were lying on their faces, and the pattern on their backs was the same as the rest of the pack. She could not tell whether they were gardeners, or soldiers, or courtiers, or three of her own children. How should I know, said Alice, surprised at her own courage. It's no business of mine. The queen turned crimson with fury, and after glaring at her for a moment like a wild beast, screamed, Off with her head, off, nonsense! said Alice, very loudly and decidedly, and the queen was silent. The king laid his hand upon her arm 
and timidly said, Consider, my dear, she is only a child. The queen turned angrily away from him and said to the knave, Turn them over. The knave did so, very carefully, with one foot. Get up, said the queen, in a shrill, loud voice, and the three gardeners instantly jumped up and began bowing to the king, the queen, the royal children, and everybody else. Leave off that, screamed the queen. You make me giddy. And then, turning to the rose tree, she went on, What have you been doing here? May it please your majesty, said Two, in a very humble tone, going down on one knee as he spoke. We were trying. I see, said the queen, who had meanwhile been examining the roses. Off with their heads. And the procession moved on, three of the soldiers remaining behind to execute the unfortunate gardeners, who ran to Alice for protection. You shan't be beheaded, said Alice, and she put them into a large flower pot that stood near. The three soldiers wandered about for a minute or two, looking for them, and then quietly marched off after the others. Are their heads off? shouted the queen. Their heads are gone, if it please your majesty, the soldiers shouted in reply. That's right, shouted the queen. Can you play croquet? The soldiers were silent and looked at Alice, as the question was evidently meant for her. Yes, shouted Alice. Come on then, roared the queen. And Alice joined the procession, wondering very much what would happen next. It's... It's a very fine day, said a timid voice at her side. She was walking with the white rabbit, who was peeping anxiously into her face. Fairy, said Alice. Where's the duchess? Hush, hush, said the rabbit in a low, hurried tone. He looked anxiously over his shoulder as he spoke, and then raised himself upon tiptoe, put his mouth close to her ear, and whispered, She's under sentence of execution. For, said Alice. Did you say, what a pity? The rabbit asked. No, I didn't, said Alice. I don't think it's at all a pity. I said, what for? She boxed the queen's ears. The rabbit began. Alice gave a little scream of laughter. Oh, hush, the rabbit whispered in a frightened tone. The queen will hear you. You see... She came rather late, and the queen said, Get to your places, shouted the queen in a voice of thunder, and people began running about in all directions, tumbling up against each other. However, they got settled down in a minute or two, and the game began. Alice thought she had never seen such a curious croquet ground in her life. It was all ridges and furrows, the balls were live hedgehogs, the mallets live flamingos, and the soldiers had to double themselves up and to stand on their hands and feet to make the arches. The chief difficulty Alice found at first was in managing her flamingo. She succeeded in getting its body tucked away, comfortably enough, under her arm, with its legs hanging down. But generally, just as she had got its neck nicely straightened out and was going to give the hedgehog a blow with its head, it would twist itself round and look up in her face with such a puzzled expression that she could not help bursting out laughing. And when she had got its head down and was going to begin again, it was very provoking to find that the hedgehog had unrolled itself and was in the act of crawling away. Besides all this, there was generally a ridge or furrow in the way wherever she wanted to send the hedgehog to, and as the doubled-up soldiers were always getting up and walking off to other parts of the ground, Alice soon came to the conclusion that it was a very difficult game indeed. The players all played at once without waiting for turns, quarreling all the while, 
and fighting for the hedgehogs. And in a very short time, the queen was in a furious passion and went stamping about and shouting off with his head or off with her head about once in a minute. Alice began to feel very uneasy. Be sure she had not as yet had any dispute with the queen, but she knew that it might happen any minute. And then, thought she, what would become of me? They're dreadfully fond of beheading people here. The great wonder is that there's anyone left alive. She was looking about for some way of escape and wondering whether she could get away without being seen when she noticed a curious appearance in the air. It puzzled her very much at first, but after watching it a minute or two, she made it out to be a grin, and she said to herself, It's the Cheshire Cat. Now I shall have somebody to talk to. How are you getting on? said the cat, as soon as there was mouth enough for it to speak with. Alice waited till the eyes appeared, and then nodded. It's no use speaking to it, she thought, till its ears have come, or at least one of them. In another minute, the whole head appeared, and then Alice put down her flamingo, began an account of the game, feeling very glad she had someone to listen to her. The cat seemed to think that there was enough of it now in sight, and no more of it appeared. I don't think they play at all fairly, Alice began, in rather a complaining tone. And they all quarrel so dreadfully, one can't hear oneself speak, and they don't seem to have any rules in particular. At least, if there are, nobody attends to them. And you've no idea how confusing it is, all the things being alive. For instance, there's the arch I've got to go through next walking about at the other end of the ground. And I should have croqueted the queen's hedgehog just now. Only it ran away when it saw mine coming. How do you like the queen? said the cat in a low voice. Not at all, said Alice. She's so extremely. Just then, she noticed the queen was close behind her, listening. So she went on likely to win, that it's hardly worthwhile finishing the game. The queen smiled and passed on. Who are you talking to? said the king, going up to Alice, and looking at the cat's head with great curiosity. It's a friend of mine, a Cheshire cat, said Alice. Allow me to introduce it. I don't like the look of it at all, said the king. However, it may kiss my hand if it likes. I'd rather not, the cat remarked. Don't be impertinent, said the king, and don't look at me like that. He got behind Alice as he spoke. A cat may look at a king, said Alice. I've read that in some book, but I don't remember where. Well, it must be removed, said the king very decidedly, and he called the queen, who was passing at the moment. My dear... I wish you would have this cat removed. The queen had only one way of settling all difficulties, great or small. Off with his head, she said, without even looking round. I'll fetch the executioner myself, said the king eagerly, and he hurried off. Alice thought she might as well go back and see how the game was going on. As she heard the queen's voice in the distance, screaming with passion. She had already heard her sentence three of the players to be executed for having missed their turns, and she did not like the look of things at all, as the game was in such confusion that she never knew whether it was her turn or not. So she went in search of her hedgehog. The hedgehog was engaged in a fight with another hedgehog, which seemed to Alice an excellent opportunity for croqueting one of them with the other. The only difficulty was that her flamingo was gone across to the other side of the garden, where Alice could see it trying in a helpless sort of way to fly up into a tree. 
by the time she had caught the flamingo and brought it back. The fight was over, and both the hedgehogs were out of sight. But it doesn't matter much, thought Alice, as all the arches are gone from the side of the ground. So she tucked it away under her arm, that it might not escape again, and went back for a little more conversation with her friend. When she got back to the Cheshire Cat, she was surprised to find quite a large crowd collected round it. There was a dispute going on between the executioner, the king, and the queen, who were all talking at once, while all the rest were quite silent and looked very uncomfortable. The moment Alice appeared, she was appealed to by all three to settle the question, and they repeated their arguments to her, though, as they all spoke at once, she found it very hard indeed to make out exactly what they said. The executioner's argument was that you couldn't cut off a head unless there was a body to cut it off from, that he had never had to do such a thing before, and he wasn't going to begin at his time of life. The king's argument was that anything that had a head could be beheaded, and that you weren't to talk nonsense. The queen's argument was that if something wasn't done about it in less than no time, she'd have everybody executed. All round. It was this last remark that had made the whole party look so grave and anxious. Alice could think of nothing else to say, but it belongs to the Duchess. You'd better ask her about it. She's in prison, the queen said to the executioner. Fetch her here. And the executioner went off like an arrow. The cat's head began fading away the moment he was gone, and by the time he had come back with the duchess, it had entirely disappeared. So the king and the executioner ran wildly up and down looking for it, while the rest of the party went back to the game.